Hey, podcast listeners, on today's episode of the Advice First podcast, we interview Steve Ingram and his son, Christopher Ingram. Now, Christopher is a financial advisor with Prosperitas Financial, and Steve, Chris's father, uh, is a legend in the classic car world. We get to dive into some classic cars as an actual asset class. Uh, This sounds crazy, but after hearing a couple of Steve's stories, you will absolutely see why. And in addition to those classic cars, we explore just alternative assets in general, how they may compare to what we're more familiar with, whether it's stock market equities uh, or real estate assets. So uh, very interesting episode, very enlightening, and I hope you enjoy it just as much as we did. Welcome to the Advice First Podcast. Welcome to the Advice First Podcast. Today I have two fantastic guests with me. Uh, They are actually related. If you were to hop on and watch this on YouTube, it, it would be pretty easy to tell. I mean, like... Uh, you know, I'm Italian, so I, I get a nice tan, but you two make me, I'm, I'm definitely not the tan one in the room, um, and I don't think anyone tries. Uh, today, we have Steve Ingram and Chris Ingram, and we've had Chris Ingram on the podcast before, the CEO of Prosperitas Financial, and Steve Ingram is going to share his expertise with all of us today about a topic I actually am very fond of, but you would not find it in most financial plans and that is the business of cars, collecting, flipping, buying, selling, restoring, saving. And uh, I'm really excited to have Chris in the studio because he brings he brings like the actual smart um, the smart perspective of being in this space. You, you had a you had a, a, a very formal term for this. What's what asset class would it be called? Um. Uh, did I have a formal term? Classic cars? I mean, investing in classic cars? It was like alternative investments. Oh, alternative investments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, so, that's a, so I just have to go home and tell my wife that, w- listen, we are heavily weighted in alternative investments. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and that gets us off the... So part of what we're going to talk about today is what is considered an investment and what is considered a money pit and just throwing money away. So that, I won't clarify that for your wife, but um, there is a difference there. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Steve, did you ever think when you got started in the just fascination of the auto industry that you were a connoisseur of alternative investments? Had no idea. (laughs) Never actually ever entered my mind. Um, I restored my very first car when I was uh, like 25, 26. And... um, I, I didn't even really realize, I think, that I was actually doing that. I just bought this car that I loved, and it was a mess. And I started by taking the valve covers off, and it got uglier. So I took the heads off, and it got uglier. So I pulled the engine out, and then I said, okay, I just took the body off the frame and started from scratch. It was a 61 Corvette, so it was a. it turned out to be a very good um investment for me at the time because I and I didn't do it for that reason but I sold it when I got married so I could buy a suit and tie to go to work selling cars wow (laughs) how much did you buy that car for do you remember I bought it for six hundred dollars oh my gosh it was uh, it was an ad in the uh, paper Uh, some guy that sold them out of his house I went there and it was a three-speed 61 Corvette that uh, it ran and drove and um, I made the mistake of, of uh, getting too many tickets and I lost my driver's license. So I was stuck at home, I well, couldn't drive the car, so I took it <laughs> apart. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, you can't buy an RC car for $600 today. It's right. You wouldn't want a $600 car. You're not going to get an entire no. car. No. Okay. And I, get the steering I, wheel. I restored the car, and back then you could buy every part for that car at the dealership. So I spent a lot of my time 
at the parts department. They just would hand me the catalog and sit, you know, I would go through it and pick out the stuff I wanted. Yeah. And uh, so everything was brand new. I bought brand new bumpers and they were so bad I had them replated. Uh, but I sold that car for $12,000 and they gave me a, a 63 Cadillac Fleetwood Rome four-door sedan that I, I drove because I had ordered a 1972 El Camino and it wasn't in yet. But you could buy a brand new Corvette and, seven, and this was in 72. You could buy a brand new Corvette for about $4,500. So it was a lot of money for that car, but it was. So you could buy a brand new Corvette for forty five hundred, and you sold your sixty one Corvette for twelve thousand dollars. Yep, man, that's good. That's good stuff. It right was. There. Uh, it sounds like you're just a great sales guy. <laughs> <laughs> Which he he then it, what, the next part of that story is him becoming a car salesman, which I, he was very successful at that too. So. I, I yeah. uh, didn't know that. I was really I taken the test to be on the fire department, and I was I was got a really good score. I I worked out for months before I went there. I I had combat boots, and I would run three miles to the liquor store to get a coke and run back just so I could keep my uh, cardio going. And uh, I got a 98.6 score on written and, and uh, physical agility, and they never called me. Oh my God. I took it with 750 other people, and it was right when they were trying to balance the ethnic uh, inequality in the fire department, and they weren't looking for white guys. Yeah. So I didn't get the job, but I got the El Camino. There you go. And uh, I sold that car, and I sold it to the people that owned the, the Chevron gas station on the Borchard Road and the 101 freeway. Wow. And I actually talked to them about four years ago, and they had just sold it. And they were regretting that they had just sold it, but uh, I, I, I think they sold it for like $40,000 or something. Oh my gosh, that's I, insane. I, just, I had a 62 that I bought at the Pomona swap meet. I didn't go there to buy a car, but <laughs> the guy made me buy it. Of course. Uh, <laughs> I asked him how much he wanted. Robert knows all about that. Yes. Uh, he told me how much he wanted for it, and I go, what? What's wrong with it? He goes, oh, not it. You know, what you see what you get. So I bought it, and uh, I bought it for like twenty eight thousand, and I kept it for four years. I was going to restore it, but it just never really got to the point where I was going to be able to do that. So I sold it. I sold it for thirty four thousand about four months ago. So wasn't the idea behind buying it but you know worked out, so it worked how, out. how how often did you drive it in the four years that you owned it uh never really i drove it from it ran and drove i drove from uh my old shop in uh over by the slugus cafe to yeah. my new shop in castake yeah. and um I think I drove it to the gas station a couple of times. It, it was, you know, one of the things people don't realize is C1 Corvettes look really cool, but they're really crummy cars to drive. <laughs> so you don't, you don't get go, okay, I can't wait to drive my 62 right. Corvette because <laughs> they really drive like crap. Well, I, evidently in 1972 they didn't because you sold one for three times the price oh, of, yeah. no. of a new Corvette. Yeah, back then standards were a little different, I think. Yeah. Chris, do you have a lot of clients with classic cars? Um, I have some. Um, I know Jerry here in our office has had quite a few clients that um, have, you know, either um, had their own collections or um, had relatives in their family that have passed away and then they open up the barn, you know, kind of mm -hmm. jokingly open up the, the garage and they find that there's three or four cars in there that have value. Um, you know, they look like piles of junk, but there's actually some real value there. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's cool. And and so like alternative alternative investments doesn't have to be. It's not limited to cars. You probably have clients with all sorts of 
air quote asset types right. that aren't you know just financial instruments yeah um yeah i mean so alternative investments here's here's my thing with alternative investments and you know this about me but um the listeners don't so i'll share this is that i think in our industry a lot of advisors steer clients away from um off the beaten path alternative investments because it's not really what we deal in. We we tend to work more with stocks, bonds, mutual funds, annuities, um, life insurance, you know, those kinds of the traditional investment. And so when people hear advisors talk about alternative assets, that typically means we're going to talk about REITs or which are real estate investment trusts or maybe some commodities or some things like that to add to the portfolio, a uh, managed futures, whatever it may be. Um, and so uh, where I'm a little bit different is that I'm totally all for and actually encourage clients to think about truly alternative um, assets to their portfolios. I'm not afraid of clients pulling money out of accounts with me and going and investing it in things that I may not benefit from because, again, my goal is always what's best for the client. So if that's going to make sense for them and help them diversify their portfolios, I, I encourage that. So um, alternative asset classes can include real estate, which people know about. Um, but let's think of some of the things that people don't think about, which, um, well, it's more popular now, digital currencies, mm -hmm. um, you know, gold and precious metals, um, uh, colored diamonds. Um, then you get into art, which some people think of, uh, wine, um, sports memorabilia, um, coins, mm -hmm. classic cars. Um, whiskey. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that can um, you can invest in and add to your um, overall diversified investment portfolio. And these are very alternative investments. They, you know, your whiskey is probably not directly tied to what the stock market is doing. So it is truly diversified and alternative um, asset class to what you have with your traditional investments. So it's a good good place to put some money. And th there's some good returns there. There's money to be made as well. It's so interesting. But, you know, I, I guess, it, one, it, it just strikes the emotional chord because obviously you're not buying bottles of wine or, or, or certain things uh, just for the asset or appreciation. So, so there has to be an emotional tie. And that's probably my biggest thing is, like, I've learned that as soon as you get emotions involved in your finances, that is a slippery slope. It can be. So you got to think about it as an investment. Think about it as a business. You, you need to separate your, your hobbies and your toys from something that is truly an investment and think about it like that. You know, we were talking about it before we started the podcast of, you know, people that restore these vehicles and they restore them the way they want them. Or, you know, my wife flips houses for a living and, you know, flipping a house the way she likes it is not always the best business, um, you know, decision because what you really want to do is, is build it, create it in a way that is going to be the most profitable if it's truly an investment. What is the market looking for? What do people want? Um, where is the demand? And where am I going to get the most bang for my buck if I'm putting money into something? So you do need to, to kind of cut and draw a line of what is my, I want this car because it's really cool versus I want to buy a car that's going to appreciate in value and is actually going to be a good investment for you. Um, you can't drink your wine you can't drink your whiskey you gotta leave it in the bottle so sports memorabilia you gotta you gotta you can't play with it you gotta you can't let your kid play with the card it's got to stay sealed and behind so there are ways that you have to treat your investments that are different from your your toys and your hobbies yeah absolutely steve do you do you target specific cars or specific makes or do you shop by the deal? Um, yes and and sometimes uh, they just come out of nowhere and you go oh, I, w I wasn't thinking about that but yeah I try to stick with the blue chip collectibles and uh, that is 55 6 and 7 Chevys can never go wrong I have a 57 Nomad that's uh, my own that God help me, I'm going to finish it here. I've been working on it. I started building it 15 years ago. It's got a brand new 2005 Corvette LS2 crate motor in it that's never been started. It's kind of embarrassing. The doctor's kids are always sick. Yeah. 
uh, but I also uh, tend to stick with the uh, the muscle cars. I got a '66 Chevelle. It's a real 396 four-speed SS car, yeah. and it's uh, uh, brand new. I mean, everything on it's brand new. It's I got a, a seventy. It is. It's, it's and, a and when I say all the floors, all the cross members. Inner and outer rockers, the door skins, read new fenders, new hood, new quarter panels. All the glass has been replaced. All of the bumpers in chrome and everything, brand new. Uh, I got a 70 Buick Skylark, which is uh, kind of a off the wall car, but um, I was building it for the guy that owns the, the auto parts store here in town. And uh, somewhere when we got to the middle of it, he decided he, he was um, he wanted to sell it, and uh, he told me how much he wanted for it. <laughs> and again, I'm an uh, idiot. I can't pass up anything. This is ridiculous. So I wrote him a check, wow. and I'm almost done with that car. It's absolutely beautiful, and it too was a frame off uh, restoration. It's got a blue printed uh, Jim uh, Grubbs motor in it wow. um, nine inch Ford rear end all powder coated beautiful and it's a 2019 Bentley color it was, wasn't my wow. choice somebody else picked the color but it's awesome yeah, uh, it looks really nice yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's absolutely beautiful and then I, I'm just finishing a 1970 911 E which uh, is the original owner's car. He bought a brand new on Santa Monica Boulevard and he drove it for years and years. He took it to G Germany because he was still in the military and he drove it on the Autobahn. He actually ran it off the Autobahn a couple of times. So I had to take a bunch of dents out of the bottom of the car. But we completely redid everything and he wanted it all in OS, so you could buy a aftermarket fender for 250, or you can get an NOS fender for 1600. We have all, all NOS fenders and hood, all the parts. He's, we're right at 204,000 right now on the restoration, and I got I got a little bit to do, but we're real close to having it done. But they only made 635 of those cars. It's a, a, a one-year-only thing, and it was the last year that Carmen Ghia made the bodies for Porsche. Wow. 71, all the Porsche 911s, the bodies were made by Porsche. Up until 71, Carmen Ghia made them all. So it's, it's a... It's a rare car. It's got to be worth uh, somewhere between uh, two fifty and three hundred thousand. Um, and uh, I got I've got a few cool things. I got an Oldsmobile that's coming in a seventy, like my Buick, that I'm uh, fixing to do a bunch of work on. So if I have my choice, I always go for the things that I know are going to ring the bell. Every once in a while, like the Buick comes into your life and you just, you know, wouldn't have been something I probably would have gone out and looking for, but right. I think it's gonna be it's gonna be good. My grandma drove a Buick Skylark. It's not champagne yeah. beige, is it? By no, any chance? No. Actually blue. It was the original color was a it was a marina blue, a little darker color. Wow. And it had a vinyl top on it, which I took off. Right. But uh, yeah, it's uh now it's like a real um, pale blue, right? And it's the, yeah, it's a, it's a it's got a lot of pearl in it, and it's got a lot, a lot of purple. purple so if you get it out in the sunlight, it's flopping around. It's a beautiful yeah, color. It's really nice, popular, yeah. popular setup. So, I mean, obviously, you you come from a place where you have the tools, you have the space, and most importantly, you have the expertise to rebuild or to get something into a highly valued asset for the average individual. You know, should they be trying to do a, you know, restore uh, an older car that they find? Let's say they find a 57 Chevy. Should they do this in their garage or should people be looking for fully restored and fully ready? to? Go I would not recommend someone that has money to invest 
in going out and buying a, a car like a 57 Chevy that needs a complete restoration is a talk about slippery slopes that's a slippery slope because it, and, and the same thing happens if they're doing it for themselves all of that stuff comes in to where they're doing stuff for themselves that probably isn't going to be the thing that the guy buying it's going to want to see yeah. Yeah. and uh, so I I think people that want to invest their money in cars uh, would be much better served to buy one that's already done mm. uh, and uh, hang on to it. Mm. I've uh, told my son, I've watched Barrett Jackson for years and and you see the same cars coming back. And if you're paying attention, uh, there's a few of them that are pretty hard not to pay attention to. One called Shazoom that was built by Boyd Connington. I've watched it go through Bear Jackson like five times, and it started out at like 125, and then it went to 225, and then it, the guy put a new stereo in it and brought it back the next year and sold for 300. So uh, those there's a lot of those cars around that if you have the money to invest in a car like that and you just hang on to it for a while, you're going to uh, reap the rewards. Yeah. Whereas building one from scratch, it, it could be a fun thing, and I wouldn't discourage it to people that want to do it because it is very rewarding, but it's, it's a little harder to actually have it make you uh, money. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and not to mention the time that it takes. Yeah. I've been working on that Porsche for three and a half years. That's yeah. crazy. So it's a... Um, yeah, it takes a while to do one right. Uh, even if you got all the money, the guy that I'm doing that for was never a money thing. Uh, it just takes time. We took the car completely apart, and it was the first one I ever got to do completely right. We sent it to uh, the bead blaster, and they bead blasted the entire car and powder coated the entire car. So when it came back to me, and I started doing all the restoration work on it, it was, um, there was no way any rust was going to happen because everything was protected. And that's the right way to do it. Yeah. That's an expensive way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. It's not the easy way, but that tends to be the right way. Right. Yeah. I think so. It, interesting. So I pulled a bunch of stats. That's who I am um, <laughs> before we were coming on here. And, uh, you know, I think the the people that are looking to restore and flip, they're looking for that fast, quick buck, um, which is a whole different animal. Even in investing in the stock market, there's people that are looking for that that trade, that quick trade where they're trying to make a lot of money real fast. And and like anything, that trade carries a lot more risk with it. Big reward, big risk. And I think that's what you get in that restoration environment where you're looking for, you know, starting from scratch and building it, and you're looking for the big win, hopefully. But there comes a lot of risk that's attached to that. Um, as I was looking at this industry, um, you know, it, it's pretty interesting. The, the car industry has actually been on fire for like the last decade. Um, and I pulled up some statistics on a, uh, it's called Knight Frank Luxury Investment Index. And so it talks about these types of, of alternative investments. Um, and it was saying that the, the luxury car, um, classic car market has actually had an average rate of return of 12% a year over the last 10 years. Um, the classic car industry, when they lump it all together, is up about 194% over the last 10 years. So almost a 200% a return on your car market and that that's not people buying and restoring and and that's just buying and holding uh, finding the right cars holding on to them and letting them appreciate in value over the last decade and so I, I think there that that's probably what most people are should be doing and is probably the safer way to play it um, but kind of like the stock market as I was diving into it, it was talking a little bit about how the market may be kind of in a bubble and there may be some froth there, that it's been going up for so long, so, you know, so fast. Um, that it may be due for a correction. And I was thinking, well, what kind of correction happens in um, you know this type of industry? So I did a little bit more research and it was talking about in the 80s, 
There was a huge surge in the 80s. A lot of it was driven by um, Japan having a strong economy. Um, and with their strong economy, they were turning around and, and investing in, in cars. There was also the crash of the stock market in 1987, which people were afraid to invest in equities, so they were looking for alternative ways to invest their money. So the car industry did really well during the 80s. But then it said in the 90s, um, right about the turn, uh, there was actually a seven-year period where prices of cars fell for a full seven years and then they didn't go up for another about four years after that so almost an 11 year run where car prices depreciated or lost value and didn't see any significant rise during that time period um, only to turn um, the you know into what 2002 and the market started rallying the other direction again and did moderately well for a while and then caught fire in the last decade and um, you know has done really well since then so just like the stock market it you know it's another industry that you kind of need to pay attention to where it is in its cycle and and should you be a buyer today or should you be looking for a better opportunity and 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 playing the ebb and flow my dad and I were talking about it before we started on the podcast though you know there is a, a something that's happening out there which is you're getting less and less um, supply there's fewer and fewer of these cars to be able to restore and flip and, and refurbish and so um, with a limited supply becomes um, you know uh, supply and demand if demand stays high and the supply continues to diminish then prices will continue to rise so there's a lot of factors to think about but it's more more like a, a stock market type investment or any other investment that you really need. To, it's not just a blindly go into it and buy those investment vehicles. You need to think about where you are in that cycle and how it may play out for you and your investment portfolio. So it's a little more to go into it than that. Absolutely. I mean, rarity come. That, that's the first thing I look for. And, and I heard you say the word, you know, the, the Porsche you're working on is one of 600 made. So that's that's like proof in point right there. Yeah. And if you look at there's a list online of in 2020 like the 10 best cars to invest in. And I think, and don't quote me on this because I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty sure the number one is a, an Alfa Romeo. So that's another thing is to understand, you know, where is the hot market and not just the hot market in general, but where is it now? What are people attracted to today? My dad was also saying um, before we got on the podcast that, you know, there's cars that are becoming popular now that, you know, 10 years ago he was looking at and going, nobody wanted this car 10 years ago but now it's the hot trendy car so you also have to look at trends in the industry and see you know people are now more attracted to this vehicle whereas a decade ago nobody even would have thought about investing into that vehicle so times change you got to stay on top of the market you know, you're getting to the point where you're where cars like the 67 corvette which is like the you know best investment car in the Corvette range and people a lot of people can't afford those so now you're seeing the 69 the, the C3s mm -hmm. are starting to be more desirable people are starting to spend money and restore those cars because the other ones are out of their financial reach the and then the same thing with the Camaros you get into the, the split bumpers and the the 70s Camaros, which nobody was really spending a lot of money on, and now they're coming along all with the Firebirds also the same years. And uh, just, you know, they're, they're not making any more of them. Right. And one of the other things that is happening, I watch a lot of uh, uh, Chasing Classic Cars, Wayne Carini, and what's happening is a lot of older people are dying and they've got all of these cars that they've kept forever, didn't want to sell them, and all of a sudden the family has them, and nobody, nobody in the family. It's like me. I got a lot of stuff, and I don't think any of the grandkids wants any of it. I actually started. Uh, I quit diecast cars, and I'm doing money now. I'm I'm, I'm investing my money in money because I know they're going to want that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you have to be uh, careful and keep up with what's what's uh, worth something today and and some of the things that weren't 
before or now. So yeah. what goes around comes around. No kidding. <laughs> I, you know, with the exception of Alfa Romero, uh, Alfa Romero and a Porsche, it sounds like a majority of these are muscle cars. Am I wrong? Like American classic muscle cars? I think there's, so from what I've seen, there's different markets and people that um, are attracted to certain things because you, you know, you're, there's a lot of real attraction to some of the, um, you know, Ferraris and some of the older classic cars on that side, old Bentleys and different Rolls Royce. And so there's, there's a lot of that market too. So I think you know, you can probably play in a lot of different markets yeah. as far as the type of cars you're attracted to and what is popular at the moment. Um, obviously we're a very American muscle family, so we tend to, to lean that direction. But, um, you know, I think there's something for everybody. And, and Porsche is another one. I, I forget what year it is. It's like the 1983. There's, there's a Porsche out there that there's even fewer than the 600 or so that he has. Yeah, the, and the, and it's, it's really like if you can find one, that's a, a gem. So um, there's some of that that, you know, I have a client that he's a hunter. So he, he knows those really rare cars and he just scours the market looking for those cars and if he can find one he doesn't care what it costs he's going to buy it and he's going to try and turn a profit on it so wow. there's some of that out there too so it just depends how you play it but there's lots of ways to play it i think well that, that's what happened with this 911 um it was totally rusted out the car was a pile of garbage when i got it so uh a lot of thought goes into, do I want to spend 200000 restoring this car? Because it was a mess. But the air-cooled uh, Porsches have gone through the roof. The, 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 I don't remember exactly what year, 97 or somewhere in there when they started water cool and the, and, and the market for those cars is very... Uh, I won't say dead, but it's not like the air cool cars. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there. I had a, had a friend here a while back that their father died, and he had a a 1954 Jaguar XK120. Jaguar was another one that was on the list a lot. Yeah, it was really. That's another one that's super popular amongst Trust. car. Yeah, this car, uh, and the reason I was involved is they wanted me to go over and look at it and try and help them find a buyer for it. And uh, I went and looked at it. I mean, all four tires were totally flat. The body was completely trashed. There was so much rust. I think if you pushed, I was afraid to push it outside for fear that something would fall off of it. Yeah. And she managed to finally find a buyer for the car. And I think she got 65000 for it. Wow. So the, the, market for cars like that. I actually called Wayne Carini, Jay Leno, and a couple other people about that car. I don't know exactly who she ended up selling it to, but um, that's, I told her when we first looked at it that, that needed, it needed to be in that ballpark because yeah. that's what the car was worth. Wow. I remember reading one time it was like, um, like, I forget the the type of car it was, but Hitler's car basically. I remember when Mercedes somebody when that car sold, it was another one of those that it sold and then it sold again, and it you know just kept getting more and more money because of the history behind it. So there's some of the, that game you can play too of you know who owned the car. Right. Um, Hitler's you know a terrible example. I don't know who. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't play in that somebody that market. Big, but good no matter how much money was there. I I don't know if I could play in that market, but um, but yeah, I mean things like Jay Leno used to own this car, or you know whatever. Um, I think could lend to it the oh, popularity and, and you pricing. got guys like Steve McQueen. I mean, if Steve McQueen drove it or touched it, yeah, and you're selling it. Uh, they're the making pretend like, Steve McQueen's nowadays and yeah. making more money off of they actually, them. They're... They actually found the bullet uh, Mustang had been hidden away in some guy's uh, garage in Indiana or someplace. And um, Steve McQueen actually tried to buy it back from the guy, and he wouldn't sell it to him. He wanted to keep it. And finally, I, I saw a couple of 
uh, of little documentaries about it. But finally, the guy that owned it, the family sold it for like two and a half million dollars. Oh, and it was a. Yeah. It needed to be restored. I mean, this was this was a car that had all kinds of body damage. It rusted. It was in a garage for years and years and years, and it's still. Well, Steve McQueen owned it. We wow. went to the that auto show recently. Remember, they had downstairs. They had all those Corvettes. Were they Corvettes? They were Corvettes, weren't they? they yeah. They found that they opened up that barn. And they yeah. they found all those old cars just stashed away in that yeah, one there was barn, a, and they restored was it them all. A barn or them. There was one where they found them. It, it was, was in like a storage. A yeah, it was yeah, a storage it was a warehouse. Big, yeah, yeah. Guys, and they just like opened up the doors. Cars in there. there was just all these cars sitting there, dust collected. I mean, you know, dust as thick as you could. You couldn't even tell what color the paint doesn't, was. Doesn't that sound like heaven? Steve? It sounds amazing, right? I'm, I'm like, I, I would, would just, love. Uh, yeah, I would just love to be the one that opened the door. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, it's a it's exciting to see old stuff like that and again people are are getting older a lot of the people like myself who have been a car person all their life um and you've got this stuff stashed away and so someday somebody else is going to sell it for you because i'm not going to be around man that's intense. I, I have a question before we, before we, uh, before you leave the studio. I want to know because we've talked about rare cars, and it feels like a rare car is a rare car. So, it, does the mileage on the car, like how how severely does that affect the car's worth when you see them at auctions and all these things? I, uh, and for the most part it doesn't. But I've noticed, and uh, if you watch enough Barry Jackson, people are finding cars that like have 25 miles on them, 30. I I don't know who these people are, <laughs> but there are tons of cars out there like that. That uh, and I so I was in a car business in '76. And the the anniversary Corvettes came out. I I sold three of them on one Saturday, and one of them was the anniversary black and silver car. And but there were people that bought those cars and drove them home, or I don't even know if they some of them picked them up with trucks and took them home, right. put them in a garage and covered them up and never touched them again. A lot of people did that with the Cadillac Eldorado convertibles because that was I think somewhere 74 somewhere in there yeah. kind of like quit making convertibles and, and swore they were never going to make convertibles again yeah and they got sued by a lot of people because they started making convertibles again right and uh, they're the ones that people bought and held on to uh, didn't really materialize they they really weren't worth any money but uh, in those instances the mileage does matter otherwise Nah, I'm just doing a 65 Mustang right now, yeah. and I'm putting a new speedometer in it. There you go. And we're not back to zero. We're not putting the mileage back <laughs> on there. It's zero, <laughs> and uh, the owner was very happy about that. Yeah, so figure it out. I yeah. mean, that's what I'm thinking. When you're replacing so many parts or starting from scratch, or you know, it's the, the car is still the car, and. Yeah, and where are we concerned about the mileage? Is the right. mileage at the motor, transmission, the... I mean, what part are we talking about? Because each one probably has a different right. number of miles on it. Yep. So, yeah. Well, it point. used to be a big deal because uh, uh, resale value was totally tied to the speedometer. So I, when I was in the car business in 72, 75, 76 in there, there were a lot of people that were returning speedometers back, and, and it was um, frowned on, to say the least. Yeah. But there were a lot of people doing it. Now it's a criminal offense, I yeah. think. Yeah. Roll back an odometer. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, it's really tough to do that because my, my truck 
emails me when my left rear tire is low. <laughs> so there's no way that you're gonna cheat on your mileage. I mean, it's on. I can go right now on my phone and right. tell you how many miles are on my truck. That's crazy. Because yeah. it's it's right on, and how much air is in all the tires. Yep. And I used to know people it, that they would just they wouldn't roll them back. They would just disengage it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah, and then they would re-engage it later. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the last thing you want to do is is buy a car that you love and hopefully will appreciate over time, but not be able to drive it because you're tr so worried about the value of the car. It sounds terrible to me. I don't understand that kind of stuff. I was I was always that kid where they're like, you know, this Star Wars toy will be really worth a lot of money later on if you don't take it out of the packaging. And I was like, what is the point? I'm taking it out of the packaging. This is Darth Vader. I'm going to cut somebody with him. Like, you know, I got to so I don't get from a car perspective to trailer at home park it in your garage and just stare at it would be like a nightmare to me mm -hmm. so. yeah so uh, right now i'm driving my dad's old uh it's not fully classic yet but i'm like this thing's getting close and it's clean it's been hiding in a garage my uh, we lost my father nine years ago and so i just started driving it again it's an 01 mustang gt and you know it's it's the 4.6 liter v8 and i'm like it sounds good. It's a new Edge Mustang. Sounds good, but I would really love to slap that five liter V8 in it. But I'm just like, does that does that ruin any potential value that might be there one day because it's not an original? Um, what do they, what do they call it? It's not like a, an era specific. Setup. We were talking about this before, and um, there there are um, some things that. Uh, are really affected by that and then there are others that it doesn't seem to matter at all um i did it i built a, a fox body mustang that we put a, a coyote motor in had yep. 1100 horsepower yeah it was in a sema show three years in a row i need you to do that again steve <laughs> okay. i would love to yeah. we built three uh, dollar mustangs for ford motor company one was for the thunderbirds and one was for the uh blue angels and one was for the tuskegee airmen wow. and they were we chrome plated the bodies and then tinted them and they had a lot of really cool stuff it was the first set of mirrors that ford made that when you pulled the handle up it shot a picture of an f-16 onto the ground that's awesome the, uh, that was on the the blue angels car yeah and then the blue angels car they took it back to uh, they were all sold at muskegee at the air show there okay and Ford Motor Company was there, Edsel Ford was there, Carroll Shelby was still alive then, and he was there. And they sold, uh, they were, one, one was a 12, one was a 13, and one was a 14. And when they all sold for 400,000 a piece, and the same guy bought all three of them. Oh, wow. He owns a, a big warehouse down in Orange County. It's actually a air, airport hangar. Wow. He's got 40 airplanes and then parked in between them are these beautiful Mustangs. Oh but uh, the splitter on the on the th all three of those cars were signed by the Thunderbirds uh, that were um, in do out on duty when we built the car. Yep. And we had nine of the Muskegee Airmen sign that that Muskegee Air car, and then the, the last Muskegee Air guy died uh, this year. Uh, I think they're all gone now. But it was it was a fun project. Mustangs. I'm a Chevy guy. Yeah. But those were those were fun to build. I love it. You might have another one in your shop soon. <laughs> bring, bring it on nice. in. I get Look forward to it. Any any parting thoughts? I'm just going to tee up our next couple of podcasts we can talk about because I thought this was super interesting to close out on just alternative investments in general. So uh, the 10-year numbers on some of these other alternative investments out there aside from cars, and then to point out how well cars did in the list. So um, let's see, bottom of the list was watches were up 60% over the last decade. Um, stamps were up 64%. Um, let's see, colored diamonds 
diamonds were up 77% over the last decade. Um, handbags were up 108% over the last decade. Um, it looks like wine was up 120% over the last decade. Art was up 141%. Coins were up 175%. Cars were up 194%. And then the, the kicker, and this is where our next podcast comes in, rare whiskey was up 564% over the last decade. Wow. So we apparently missed the boat on the rare whiskey trade. I mean, how much are empty bottles worth? <laughs> yeah. Because that, that's, that's going back to what you were saying about driving the car. I don't know yeah. that I could take the rare whiskey and put it on the shelf for the 10 year period, but 564%, that's, that's a pretty darn good return. Well, we'll have to get into that. With we it. need a whiskey guy to come in here and tell us all about it. Steve, you like whiskey? I quit drinking alcohol about 10 years ago. Um, He's more of a tequila guy, so. Yeah. Got it. When, I used to when be, he was younger, he was more of a tequila guy. Yeah, I so used to be a maybe that's Puerto, where I get it. 1800 guy, and I drank gold gimlets, and that was my that and uh, Long Island iced tea. I still like it, it's just that I don't do it. Um, but well, you'll be the guy that we should give the rare bottle of whiskey I'll to be, then. I'll be yep. the guy It'll be safe on his shelf. <laughs> <laughs> it won't go anywhere. But the one thing I don't... Versus the freezer in our office right. where that whiskey doesn't last long around here. Yeah, the one thing I just say is that uh, um, in, in the numbers that we're seeing for the last year, we got to realize that there's been no place for anybody to sell their cars because we haven't had any auctions or, you know, I used to go to the Pomona swap meet, like I said, and, and buy parts or uh, sell stuff there. And all of those things have been um, non-existent. So I think we're, we're going to see probably next year a big surge in and uh, values of things because people will once again be able to get out there and actually sell their stuff. Wow. Um, yeah, that's true. People will probably be excited to just get back and willing to pay a premium to kind of get exactly. back into the mix of things. And that's why I'm looking forward to I'm almost done with my Buick and I'm going to take it to Barrett Jackson wow. and uh, we're going to enjoy ourselves and sell it. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Steve, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us. Chris, thanks for joining us. Of course. And until next time. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Next Financial Group, Inc., member FINRA SIPC, Prosperitas Financial is not an affiliate of Next Financial Group, Inc., this material is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase of sale of any security or other financial instrument. Past performance does not guarantee future performance. All the views expressed are those of Robert Clark and Prosperitas Financial and not of those of Next Financial Group, Inc. Next does not offer tax or legal advice. The S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index composed of common stocks of 500 leading companies in the leading industries of the U.S. economy. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is a price-weighted index of 30 actively traded blue-chip stocks.